people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. New York Times and American Daily mocked India's Mars orbit mission Mangalayan in 2014, implying it was a fluke for a third world country like India to achieve a feat that had previously been accomplished by just three space agencies. The racist and elitist remark received a massive pushback from Indians and from everyone who was even remotely associated with science. Fast forward 28 months, India scripted history by successfully putting 104 satellites into orbit in a single mission. Thanks to tireless efforts of Indian Space Research Organization or ISRO and other Indian agencies that have also made a mark. India has not just fine-tuned its space missions and has enhanced payload capacity of its rockets, but has efficiently developed a space program that has outperformed its rivals in terms of tech and competence and has compelled space players from world over to look to India for assistance. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. The Indian space story began in the little-known fishing hamlet, Tumba, in India's southern state of Kerala in the 1960s. From space launches and operations, to inventing technologies, to developing commercial satellite launch facilities, the velocity of the Indian space journey has been exponential and second to none. The Indian space program has developed powerful and comprehensive standard operating procedures from launch to landing. India's Space Exploration Agency, ISRO, which dominates the Indian space industry, has led successful milestones for the country as well as other countries by launching their satellites. Recently, ISRO's launch vehicle Mark III successfully placed 36 satellites of OneWeb, an Indian-owned UK-based company, completing the first-generation Low Earth Orbit constellation. Let me take this opportunity to thank once again the entire ISRO community uh, for their uh, work towards making this rocket one of the best in this class and it actually increased the confidence on us on this rocket GSLV Mark III for taking up the uh, Gaganyan which is going to be flying on this rocket as well. More recently, ISRO's reusable launch vehicle, RLV, successfully landed, bringing India closer to the dream of its own space plane and sustainable space exploration. The technique adopted to launch the vehicle was first in the world. A winged body was carried by a helicopter to an altitude of 4.5 kilometers and released for an autonomous landing on the runway. ISRO successfully demonstrated its innovative and cost-effective technologies which have made it part of an elite space club. India, with the support of ISRO, has emerged as a leader in third-party launch services. India has earned a massive revenue of 279 million USD till now by launching satellites for 34 countries by ISRO. India's space industry's role has been instrumental in developing several application areas including weather forecasting, navigation, oceanographic studies, disaster management, and agriculture. Experts say that this Indian step will soon prove to be a game changer. The opening of the space economy to private participation in all phases of activities has ushered in an era of growth, innovation, and accelerated investment in the sector. We scripted history today by successfully launching India's first privately developed rocket, Vikram Yes. <laughs> Team Skyru dedicates this successful mission to Dr. Vikram Sarabhai who boldly started the Indian space program in the 1960s and Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi ji 
who unlocked the space sector to the private players. In line with India's self-reliant initiative, India will soon be launching its first ever at Manirbar human flight, Kaganyaan. The objective of the project is to take a three-man crew into orbit for five to seven days and bring them back to Earth safely. India allocated $137 billion to the Department of Space in 2022 to 2023 for the smooth running of all of its missions. As per a report by the Indian Space Association and Ernst & Young, the satellite manufacturing sector is expected to grow from $2.1 billion in 2020 to $3.2 billion in 2025, while launch services will grow from $567.4 million in 2020 to $1 billion in 2025. For the broader interest of people all over the world, India has forged space project collaborations with the United Nations, BRICS nations, as well as with Israel, NASA, and the European space. India's breakthrough technological work has resulted in success for India's space sector. Government initiatives and reforms are on track to be game changers for India's space sector further expediting the industry's growth. India created history by becoming the first country to enter the orbit of the Red Planet in its first attempt. The pioneering mission, Mangalyaan, was the most economical mission ever to Mars. Its budget was about 75 million, which cost only 11% of NASA's Mars Atmosphere and Volatile Evolution mission, MAVEN. The Indian space spirit is determined and limitless. Experts say the day is not far when India's lunar exploration mission will be a success. Moving on. As people in Afghanistan continue to bear the brunt of Taliban 2.0, the United Nations is making some serious efforts to forge a consensus amongst the de facto rulers and the international community, which has been working in the war-torn country for different assistance programs. Earlier, the United Nations had to instruct its staff to stop coming to office after the Taliban imposed a ban on working women. While the UN has time and again asked the group to give equal opportunities to women, it has now hinted at dialogue for a peaceful and permanent resolution. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres will meet the foreign envoys to Afghanistan on May 1st and May 2nd to come up with a cohesive strategy for dealing with the Taliban leadership. The meeting will essentially focus on reinvigorating the international engagement around common objectives for a durable way forward on Afghanistan. The decision comes in wake of Taliban's stepped-up anti-women decrees that have restricted women from working for the UN or for any other organization. The Taliban essentially do not want to see women in public space. The Taliban claims that it has always respected women in accordance with the interpretation of Islamic law. Since toppling the Western-backed governments after US-led forces withdrew following 20 years of war, the Taliban has also tightened controls over women's access to public life, including barring women from university and closing most girls' high schools. What I can say is that the Doha conference uh, on the 1st and 2nd of May is not focusing on recognition, and we don't want there to be any confusion about that. The point of the discussion, which will be held in a closed private setting, is to build a more unified consensus on the challenges at hand. Uh, as you know, there's a, a need to reinvigorate international engagement uh, around the, the sort of common objectives that the international community has on Afghanistan. Uh, and so we consider it a priority to advance an approach based on pragmatism and principles uh, to have a constructive engagement uh, on the issue. So that is where we will be focusing. The United Nations had earlier asked some 3,000 staff, men and women, to stay home until May 5 while it made necessary consultations. Some officials have flagged concerns 
donors may pull back on support to Afghanistan's humanitarian aid program, the largest in the world, and that implementing some programs and reaching women in the conservative country without female workers would not be possible. There are many others who are anticipating that the global community will give recognition to the Taliban, a status that the group has been demanding since it returned to power in 2021. Let me give you a bit on, on that. Uh, the meeting, there will indeed be a meeting in Doha on May 1st um, and 2nd, uh, which the Secretary General will host um, with special envoys on Afghanistan from various uh, countries. The purpose of uh, this kind of small group meeting is for us to reinvigorate um, the international engagement around the common objectives for a durable way forward on the situation in Afghanistan. In December, the 193-member UN General Assembly approved postponing for the second time a decision on whether to recognize the Afghan Taliban administration by allowing them to send a United Nations ambassador to New York. The Taliban have imposed a series of restrictions on women's access to work, education and public life. Countries around the world have been asking the group to remove these restrictions, but the Taliban haven't cared to give any attention to these appeals and demands. There is no end to the miseries of the people in Pakistan as the Islamic nation is facing an incessant economic crisis amid poor governance. High inflation, rising unemployment and a growing shortage of food has led the South Asian nation into a deep crunch. Recently, a Pakistani journalist had a rare outburst on Twitter, cursing her grandfather for making the decision to choose Pakistan over India during partition. A testimony to the diverging fortunes of the two South Asian nations. One nation, a thriving democracy, heralded as a bright spot in the world, marching towards becoming a global superpower, the other dealing with food riots and a spiraling economic situation. We find out the reasons behind Pakistan's economic collapse and the never-ending miseries of its people. A large number of underprivileged people across Pakistan who are not able to afford necessary food items due to rising inflation are forced to queue for hours to grab a bag of free flour. It is chaos all across the country as residents are not only facing disgrace but danger to their lives. On March 31st, 11 people, including women and children, lost their lives in a stampede during the distribution of food aid in Karachi City. At least five other people have been killed and several injured in recent weeks at sites in other provinces in Pakistan. Thousands of bags of flour have also been looted from trucks and distribution points. The people in Pakistan are feeling distressed due to soaring costs, which are exacerbated by Pakistan's falling currency. Recently, a Pakistani journalist had a rare outburst on Twitter, cursing her grandfather for making the decision to choose Pakistan over India during partition. The government has even removed subsidies due to a settlement with the International Monetary Fund to unlock the latest tranche of its financial support packages. The cost of basic goods across the country has surged, with flour prices rising twofold. ਕੋਈ <laughs> वक्त और हालात ऐसे हो गए कि काम दो टके का नहीं है मजदूर बंदा क्या करे तनख्वाहदार का तो तनख्वाह मिल रही है जो वो हाथ से करने वाले हैं या डेली वर्क है करने वाले उनका क्या बनेगा इस बारे में कोई हुकूमत सोच रही है अगर सोच रही तो जवाब दे टू अवेल फंड्स फ्रॉम द आईएमएफ एज पार्ट ऑफ अ 6.5 मिलियन यूएसडी बेल आउट पैकेज अग्रीड अपॉन इन 2019 द पाकिस्तानी गवर्नमेंट हैज मेड वेरियस इकोनॉमिक मॉडिफिकेशंस 
including the imposition of higher taxes and a hike in fuel prices. The IMF has also asked Pakistan, a country of some 220 million people, to provide its external financing assurances before it takes the next step to release the bailout tranche. The country, with its poor record of corruption, has foreign reserves of 4.2 billion USD as of the week ended on March 24th, which will provide an import cover of less than one month. If you look at Pakistan currency, it is written on the state bank of Pakistan that it will be paid for the state bank of Pakistan. What will it be paid for? The amount that you have to pay for the bank is paid for. Or if you ask for foreign currency, it will be paid for it. When I have a commercial bank, I said that I will not give a dollar. This means that you have to fold. Pakistan has a history of political uncertainty, discontinuity of macroeconomic policies, extremism, corruption, and energy shortages. Such deficiency create hurdles, preventing Pakistan from becoming an investment-friendly nation. Many foreign companies in Pakistan are on the brink of shutdown. Pakistan is teetering on the edge of complete chaos as it continues to face political clashes and financial collapse. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. First responders from various departments practice emergency scenarios after a simulated Chinese attack on Taiwan's outlying island of Nangan, part of the Matsu archipelago, weeks after Beijing concluded war games around Taiwan. The pre-planned annual series of drills which help raise readiness for natural disasters and other emergencies were modified to include elements of warfare following the war in Ukraine and a heightened sense of threat from neighboring China. Pretend explosions could be seen at a local power plant, the only one in the archipelago that is located only kilometers off the southern Chinese coast, and emergency responders carrying victims with gaping fake wounds to safety. Russia's defense ministry said this week that eight of its long-range bombers flew over neutral waters in the Sea of Okhotsk and Sea of Japan. The aircraft provided air support to the forces of the Russian Pacific Fleet. A Pacific Fleet task force including a corvette and small anti-submarine ships held firing drills in the Sea of Japan. The ministry also said in an earlier statement. The training sorties and drills are part of a snap review of the Russian forces in the Pacific ordered by President Vladimir Putin started on April 14 and lasted till April 22. Meanwhile, Japan's chief cabinet secretary said that Tokyo had lodged a protest with Russia over its military exercises around disputed islands near Japan's Hokkaido. Matsuno also said that Russia informed Tokyo that it would conduct missile exercises around the disputed islands. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said last week that normalizing relations with Saudi Arabia would be a giant leap towards ending Arab-Israeli conflict. Israel has opened diplomatic ties with several Arab countries since 2020, including Saudi Arabia's neighbors, the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain. But Riyadh has held back from recognizing Israel, saying such moves should be tried to resolving Palestinian statehood goals. A huge setback for Netanyahu's efforts came last month when a China broker deal saw Israel's major regional for Iran mend its ties with Saudi Arabia. Iran's embassy in Riyadh reopened its gates last Wednesday for the first time in seven years. Meanwhile, in a separate incident which is interconnected in larger geopolitical context, 
Israel's foreign ministry said it had asked China to exert influence on Iran to prevent it from obtaining nuclear weapons. Fans of K-pop singer Moon Min placed notes, flowers and photos in front of the singer's music label office in Seoul this week, mourning his sudden death. Local media reported that singer was found dead at his home in the Gangnam district of Seoul and that suicide was suspected. Police declined to comment. Moon Min was a child actor before making his debut as a member of Astro in 2016. He was set to appear at a concert in the southern city of Busan next month as part of subunit Moonbin and Sana. Moving on, the Himalayan nation of Nepal echoed with dance and music as people across the country marked the beginning of Hindu lunar year. From family gatherings to traditional parades to food and drink, the festival which is celebrated in the Hindu calendar month of Chaitra brings together everybody and is celebrated with great fervor every year. Hundreds of people from the Nevar community, a majority ethnic group in Nepal, marched through the streets to celebrate the Lunar New Year with great enthusiasm. To celebrate the Lunar New Year, devotees thronged in Bhaktapur, a city famous for its religious, cultural and historical heritage. People carried out a huge procession and danced to traditional beats, carrying idols of deities in 32 palanquins draped in orange vermilion around the city's Balakumari temple. Yo. थिमिकोये in many regions, this festival is celebrated after the spring harvest or during the harvest season. And the harvest season is special for the people of the Indian subcontinent. Hence, people in different corners of the Indian subcontinent celebrate the Lunar New Year of Nepal. The songs and the beats during this occasion revolve around subjects like harvesting of crops, marriage rituals, war stories and love angles. Playing with vermilion signifies love and is a symbol of prosperity. The Nepali New Year holds an opportunity for renewal and hope. And to look to the future with new aspirations and optimism. Nepal has more than 60 ethnic groups with unique and rich cultural traditions. In other words, Nepal is a live example of unity in diversity. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. People have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. 
civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. 